Thank you for that lovely introduction, Clark. And thank you all for coming out tonight for an evening um, celebrating modern fairy tales, contemporary fairy tales. Thanks especially to the Chicago Public Library, the Chicago Humanities Festival, and One Book, One Chicago, um, and especially thanks to Anna, Annie and to Corinna and the Seminary Co-op for selling the books. Um, it's just so nice to see so many people come out and join in the wonder, and an honor to be here with Lydia Millett, a terrifying and magical writer I so admire on so many levels. Library readings, of course, are always so special for me, um, for it was in the library that I discovered many fairy tales when I got a pass to the adult room in the Wabin Public Library, upstairs, that magical place where the fairy tales were shelved. There were also many magical books in the basement, of course. Libraries themselves are real fairy tales. To get us in the mood of the tradition tonight, I'm going to just say a few introductory remarks about contemporary fairy tales, their place, this sort of state of the fairy tale nation address, if you will. Um, and then I'll turn um, things over to Lydia, who will read a story from the collection My Mother, She Killed Me, My Father, He Ate Me, 40 New Fairy Tales, which I edited for Penguin, came out in the fall. And then I'm going to read a very brief tale, and then if there's time, we'll take some audience questions. But first, to really get us in the mood, I'm going to read an old Grimm's tale to you. I think so often we come to the phrase fairy tales laden and burdened by abstractions and sometimes cliches. So I like to read a little bit of an unexpected tale just to get us into the language and sound. This is called Friendly Animals. A little orphan girl sat spinning at the foot of the ramparts when suddenly a grass snake crawled out of a crack in the wall. Quickly, she spread out her blue kerchief beside her the kind that snakes love to sit on. When the snake saw that, it turned around and vanished, but soon came back carrying a tiny gold crown, put the crown on the kerchief and went away. The little girl picked up the glittering crown, which was made of finely spun gold. After a while, the snake came a second time. When it saw that the crown wasn't there anymore, it crept back to the wall. Stricken with grief, it beat its head against the stone as long as its strength held out and finally lay there dead. If the little girl had left the crown lying on the kerchief, the snake would probably have brought her more treasures from its hole. Quite a happy ending. <laughs> Mysterious, too, and beautiful and terribly sad. It's a riddle we, contain, we understand intuitively as a story, at the same time as it makes little sense. And we sense in these stories, I think, especially the traditional versions, the sublime. Scholars have discussed the power of fairy tales for many years. Recently, um, Polish radio, you may have heard this story, called for donations of fairy tale books to be sent to a boy in the hospital who'd eaten a poisonous mushroom because they felt that the fairy tale books would give him the courage to live, even though he lay in a coma. It sounds like a fairy tale itself. Traditional fairy tales with their flat language, their everyday magic, and their just so arrangements console us. At the same time, they're full of the bewilderment and darkness, the very bad luck that march, mark each of us at some time in our lives. Children have direct access to the odd, entwined sorrow and joy in domestic myths. And thankfully, as evidence tonight, many former children, as Andre Breton called us, um, readers and writers do too, despite every effort by various forces to try to wring wonder from us as we grow up. Because I love fairy tales so much as a reader and writer, and because their stories of underdogs surviving against all the odds offered me as a kid much consolation, I feel it's such an honor to act as a steward for them in a time of real fairy tale revival. They're influential on so many writers whose work I love, whether overtly in their shape or secretly in just tidbits of language and image, those crumbs on a path. Writers who might consider themselves narrative realists even, writers who might consider themselves avant-garde poets, you can see the fairy tales in their body of work. And evenings like this are a glimpse into the cracked hall of mirrors of fairy tales' primal vintage and futuristic reflections, a glimpse together into the whole that they have and will have ever after, at least as long as we all need stories, that is. For a long time, at least since the rise of the novel, those who stand at the gates of capital L literature have unfortunately considered fairy tales a lesser art form. As just one of many examples, the National Book Foundation, which does so much excellent work,
for writers and readers has an official line in their prestigious award guidelines stating that retellings of fairy tales are excluded from consideration for the awards. Retellings of Shakespeare are not excluded. Retellings of Jane Austen are not excluded. Retellings of the Bible or retellings of Gone with the Wind are not excluded. Only retellings of fairy tales along with folk tales and myths have been singled out, much like their banished heroes sent to fend for themselves in the woods with the animals where they must make a new magic home. We've started a petition, the scholar Maria Tatar and I, to have the exclusion removed. And so far, the response we've received was very warm, but firm, that the exclusion is intended only to prevent unoriginal books from being submitted. Fairy tales, what unoriginal teeth you have. <laughs> but like the girl in the story, I'm not afraid of a bad fairy tale. I was recently interviewed by the LA Times about all the fairy tale movies coming out, and they said, well, are you afraid that there are going to be some bad movies made. Um, and I said, I said, no, I'm not, I, you know, I'm really, the bad fairy tales don't keep me awake at night. Um, so I think it's good. Um, these stories survive mutation over the years, and they survive the abuse. And the stories themselves don't flinch from the hard facts of life, and they reward those stories and readers who understand that the world doesn't belong to anyone just at the same time as it belongs to us all. Um, so people who think of stories having owners, stories as property, must claim fairy tales are less real and less valuable. Such wild communal wonder is less serious and is not real. But fairy tales are real. And things are getting better for them for the moment. We're returning to their darker roots. And as the world becomes increasingly technological, and experiences more environmental change. All kinds of artists, filmmakers, authors, and readers are returning to their magic, to their world, where humans are not quite separated from animals yet, and wonders might happen amidst all the fear. I don't take nights like tonight at all for granted, and thank you all for being here for this vital story form. And I'm delighted to sit back now for a while and hear Lydia Millett. She's simply amazing. Hi, and thanks again to all of you for coming. Um, I'm going to read uh, a story I wrote for, for Kate's collection um, tonight, or a, a, an abridged version of it. I cut the boring parts out for you guys, so I hope you appreciate that. Um, it's actually, it's based on another tale by the Brothers Grimm, and the tale's one of their uh, happy ending marries a prince tales, which are, of course, uh, far you know, far rarer in the Brothers Grimm than Disney would have you believe, but this is one of them. And it's a tale about um, a mother and her two lovely and loving daughters who live in a cozy cottage, and one winter night a bear comes calling, knocking on the door. It's apparently one of those non-hibernating bear species. Um, and they let the bear in, and they pet it and groom it and befriend it, and it stays with them most of the winter. But come spring, the bear goes away again, saying something about a dwarf and some treasure. Uh, and so the, the two young girls start you know, going out and doing the gambling you know, that maidens will do in the fields come spring, gambling, cavorting, that kind of thing. And they come upon um, a small man with a very long gray beard. And they extricate this man from, from unpleasant situations, I think three times by clipping off the end of his very long beard, and he always responds with great anger um, instead of gratitude, and sort of insults them. And, um, and finally, the bear reappears, and, and, and actually the, the dwarf um, offers up the girls as a sacrifice to the bear, uh, even though they have indeed done him so many good turns. But the bear rejects that and proceeds to, you know, end the life of the small man. Um, who was so who was so very proud of his of his beard, and then the bear uh, becomes a prince again, as he always, of course, was underneath that furry pelt, and marries Snow White, and also finds um, a husband for her sister in the form of his brother, and they live in the palace, and everything is well. So my version of the story is not exactly the same, but you'll see some parallels. Called Snow White, Rose Red. I met the girls and instantly liked the girls. 
Of course I liked the girls. A girl is better than a feast. This was before the arrest, before the indictment. The girls were sisters and lived during the summer in one of those upstate mansions built by the robber barons who made their fortunes off railroads and steel and unfair business practices. It was in the lower peaks of the Adirondacks, the southern part, with glassy lakes and green slopes and white spotted fawns. The girls called their summer house the cottage to distinguish it from the apartment, which was a 10,000 square foot penthouse on Fifth Avenue near Washington Square Park. Their father was in real estate, but no one ever saw him. Correction, from time to time we caught sight of him briefly, the girls and I, getting in or out of a long, gleaming car. Once from the woods, I spotted him walking down to the dock in a pale gray suit, his phone held to his ear. He looked like a groom doll on a wedding cake. I wanted to tear his legs off. Their mother, a former ballerina from Madrid, was both anorexic and mentally slow. At twilight on the grounds of the massive yet log cabin style robber baron mansion, dozens of deer stood around, their graceful necks lowered, eating the grass. There's an abundance of deer up there due to the hunters who killed off all the animals that were supposed to be preying on them. So the deer. And the girls, equally graceful, with their light carrying laughter and long limbs, spun glow in the dark hula hoops or played croquet with ancient peeling mallets as the purple dusk fell. We only met because I came out of the woods one night. I came out of the woods and walked right across the rolling lawn, scattering the bambies. The sun was setting over the lake and a slight breeze rippled the water. I admit the girls appeared frightened. What Rosa told me later was this. That first few seconds, they actually mistook me for a bear. They'd never seen a homeless guy before. They were that sheltered, even though they lived in downtown Manhattan. Trust me, it can be done. And though I wasn't technically homeless, I had that same dirty hirsute aspect. I'm not a small man, but tall and barrel-chested. And that June evening, I wore filthy clothes and a long beard and needed badly to bathe in the lake. I had a home, an abandoned airplane hangar in the woods. But to girls that pampered and young, there's no perceptible difference between an aging hippie and a transient. So they were frightened at first. But I held up my hands as I walked up to the porch. I held up my hands like a man who was surrendering. Those girls were good. Plenty of rich girls aren't. We all know that. But those two girls were innocent. I don't know how they turned out that way with the mother who wasn't all there and the father who wasn't there at all. That goodness came from them like milk from a rock. Often at dawn or dusk, when the deer and the girls were out, I was the only company they had. I kept a low profile and did not throw the frisbee back and forth with them in case someone could see us from the house. Usually we stood together and we talked a little out of sight. Once or twice they sat on the end of the dock and trailed their feet through the water, and I swam, only my head above the darkening surface. From the high bedroom windows of the cottage's second floor, that wouldn't have looked like anything. The girls let me use the canoes in the boathouse, even encouraged me and some mornings I would row out into a hidden bay and sit and drift, trying idly to fish in the shade of a red pine. Snow would leave me sandwiches. Rose offered small hotel bottles of shampoo and told me to use them. These girls were both honest. Once Snow said to me, you smell not too good. Did you know? I told her that I washed my clothes whenever I could. I tried to swim and use soap on myself, but now and then I lost track and missed a day or two. I wish you wouldn't, said Snow wistfully. My back hurt from sleeping on the cement floor of the airplane hangar, and I ended up asking the sisters for aspirin. Then Rose said I should sleep in the cottage, which had more bedrooms than could easily be counted. There was a servant's entrance, and none of the help used it. I could sneak in at night and sleep in a comfortable bed, which had down pillows and high thread count sheets. I protested at first. I feared the other members of the household. But it was silent when I snuck in there at night after the girls had gone to bed. It was so quiet that it almost seemed to me they lived there by themselves, and food and water were furnished to them by invisible hands. So I often slipped in by the servants' narrow stairs and slept in my private room, tucked up under the roof. I set my wristwatch alarm and crept out at the crack of dawn. The cottage doors were never locked during the summer months. The family was always there, the family or the staff. 
The Mexican groundskeeper rode around on his lawn tractor uselessly, mowing nothing, happy to sit aloft. The live-in maid smoked cigarettes near the garden shed and slipped away to have sex with him in the bushes. One day the mother had a brief flash of life and donned her sparkling tennis whites. She ran outside and hit a few balls feebly with Rose on the clay tennis court. Meanwhile, snow on the sidelines took snapshots for the family album. It was a rare occasion to see the mother outside in the sun, acting alive like that. But only 15 minutes passed before the mother went inside again. She threw her racket down and blurted something I couldn't quite make out. I saw the girls' faces as they watched her go. Their faces were both sad and calm. The girls were resigned to this beautiful, semi-retarded mother with her spidery limbs and odd tantrums. Perhaps she was never a ballerina, I thought to myself. There aren't too many retarded ballerinas in this world, is my perception of the thing. Although there certainly are a few who, like the mother, starve themselves. That evening around dusk, the girls came swimming with me in the lake. Rose lathered my hair up with shampoo and ducked my head under, laughing. When I came up spluttering and trying to catch my breath, Snow pushed my head under again, so both of them were playfully drowning me. Rose said, what would he look like with no beard? Snow looked at me too, considering, and then climbed up onto the dock and ran into the house. She came back in a minute with shaving equipment and cut off the part of my beard that hung. Then they watched while I sat in the shallows and with Rose holding up the mirror, shaved off the stubble that was left. He's not that bad, she said when I was done. I dipped my face under and came up again, wiping the water away from my eyes, the flecks of girl-scented shaving foam floating. He looks like that actor, said Snow, cocking her head. You know, that big French one with the crooked nose? You look like that actor, concurred Rose, nodding. He's sort of ugly, said Snow, and you have to like him. Exactly, said Rose, ugly like you, but also likable, said her older sister. Girls, I said ruefully, you're going to have to find a way to tell the truth a little less often. Why? asked Snow. Well, for one thing, it hurts people's feelings. We're sorry, said Rose. We didn't mean to. I know, I said, I know. And B, if you get in this habit of telling men the truth, you'll never find love and get married. I won't get married anyway, said Rose. I won't either, said Snow. How do you know, I asked. It seems really stupid, said Snow. Like cutting off your leg, said Rose. Every marriage is different, I said. Get out, said Snow. Well, you're supposed to be married, said Rose, but now your wife likes someone else better. So soon you won't be anymore. More or less accurate, I conceded. Then why are you defending it, asked Snow. Once you were practically normal, added Rose, but now you carry a roll of toilet paper around in a greasy, disgusting backpack. And she shuddered visibly. It was then that we heard a rare sound, at least rare to us in the tranquility of those summer evenings, car tires crunching on gravel in front of the house. No way, breathed Snow. Daddy, said Rose. It's the third time this whole summer, said Snow. The first time lasted for an hour, Rose told me. The second was on my birthday, said Snow. He stayed 15 minutes. He brought me a gift certificate. I tensed up, worried I'd get caught with them. My clothes were heaped on the bank, except for the boxer shorts I wore. There was a clean line of sight if he came around the corner. But I had other clothes in the hangar, so all I had to do was swim away, swim across to the part of the shore that was hidden from the house by trees, and from there retreat to my hangar. I should go, I said. Don't worry, we're, we'll totally distract him, said Rose. They climbed up onto the dock, legs dripping, towels swirled up around their shoulders, feet left wet prints on the dry wood before they slipped into flip-flops. Then the girls were headed up the grassy slope, not running, not eager, just dutiful. I felt a rush of thankfulness that I'd never had children to disappoint. Though I wish the girls were my own daughters, even I would have shone in comparison with the gray doll. I sank down in the water and spied on them, the water line beneath my nose. I kept my mouth clamped shut. The suit was undertaker black this time, and I could just make out a silver-colored headset. He talked into that headset as the girls went up the hill to meet him. Rose stepped toward him awkwardly, as though she wanted to embrace, but he held up his hand and shook his head and kept walking, turning around as he paced. She stepped back. It occurred to me then that they would, they would be better off if he died, but it was an academic, impersonal thought. It had nothing to do with me. A second later, it also occurred to me that if someone tore the groom in half, 
The girls would still have his money, but not his cold and persistent disregard. It was painful, on the other hand, the loss of a father. And with a semi-retarded mother on the brink of death surprisingly often, due to the repeated self-starving activities, which made her subject to sudden hospital visits, the poor girls might be farmed out to relatives, separated. So as quickly as I had it, I gave up the idea of murdering him. You know, murder goes through your head sometimes, and then goes out again. It's normal, in my opinion. Anyway, the thought had no bearing on subsequent events. After a while, the father stopped talking into his headset. By that time, the girls had already given up and drifted into the house without, as far as I could tell, even a smile of greeting from him. Some fragments of his one-sided conversation floated down to me, a few words in the twilight, value-added, deal structure, and possibly red herring. Then he too disappeared. What happened la that later that night was simple, as I would testify. Around one in the morning, as I lay trying to sleep on the hangar floor, my back started to hurt. It hurt a lot, mainly because there was nothing between me and the cracked cement but a threadbare sleeping bag I'd filched from a Goodwill bin in Albany. So finally, driven by discomfort, I crept out onto the dirt road, pain shooting through my back, grasping my heavy antique flashlight. There was a dim glow in the ground floor windows of the mansion where lamps had been left on. But through those windows, I could see no one was reading by their light. The family was sleeping. So I went around behind the house and up the servant's stairs, taking off my shoes and walking in my sock feet. I found my room as usual and went to sleep myself, so relieved by the comfort of the bed that I forgot my back. But presently, I, woke up, I was woken up. There was a loud, terrible noise. Bleary, I didn't recognize it at first. I thought it was a cat in pain or trying to mate. Then I understood it was human, human and female. I sat right up, jolted with fear for those sweet girls. I had to do something. So I grabbed my flashlight and ran out into the corridor. I didn't know the house at all, only the route to my secret cubby. So I was stumbling down narrow halls like I was in a maze, basically running blind this way and that, trying to follow the screaming. It stopped for a short time and I faltered partly in confusion, partly out of a growing conviction that the sound wasn't coming from either of the girls. It was too feral and too hoarse. But then it started up again and I ran, tearing up and down halls in a panic because I couldn't be sure. Eventually I came out into a wider hall where lights were ablaze, a long carpet down the middle, and there was the mother. She wore nothing at all and was so emaciated that her jutting ribs resembled zebra stripes. I couldn't help but notice she, she was shaved completely bare beneath. And there was the father in seersucker pajamas who seemed to be choking or suffocating her. They were thrashing around and she must have been the one screaming, though now his fingers were over her mouth. He had the upper hand, clearly, being a man and not mentally or physically impaired. A fear seized me, though behind that fear I was relieved that Snow and Rose were not the, ta the targets of this violent assault. And without thinking, I threw myself into the fray. The flashlight was the only weapon I had, and as I said, it was heavy. Before I knew it, the groomed doll lay upon the ground, the left side of his head stove in. Once we understood the gravity of the situation, I knelt beside him and performed CPR. Rose in her frilly teddy bear nightgown called 911. Snow sat, her face solemn, and held one of her father's limp white hands. Only the starving mother, still naked, hung back, sitting with her knobby knees raised to her chin against the far wall's wainscoting, beneath the pompous portrait of a wattled ancestor. As you may already be aware, if you're the type to follow crime beat or society news stories, the father did not die. In fact, and this is a little known, he came out of the hospital substantially improved. It was as though he'd had a personality alteration, the sort that might follow a frontal lobotomy. He was more pleasant after he recovered. He had more leisure time. I even heard from my lawyer that he sought professional help for the mother. Not for the retardation, I don't think. Uh, there isn't much they do for that but for the, dis for the eating disorder. Myself, I didn't fare so well. It adds up against you when you're indigent at the time of felony commission, abusing alcohol, etc., even if the crime was committed in defense of a vulnerable party. And there was the trespass issue. Although the girls, I have to say, did not desert me in my hour of need. They told the police I'd had their full permission to sleep in the house that night. Sadly, due to their ages, 11 and 12, that testimony did not go fear, far to clear me of the trespass charge. I never heard from the girls again, not personally. I sometimes dwell on my last moments with those girls. It's true we sat upon an old carpet, discolored by the father's 
spreading blood between dark painted walls adorned with grim, even judgmental looking paintings of the girl's dead relatives. It's true our clothing was splattered and gruesome, and the unconscious father was stretched out between us, casting a pall. But I gazed up and around when I'd done all the CPR I could. It was a kind of coma, I guess, though it wouldn't last long once they got him to the emergency room, and saw the semi-retarded mother, even a ballerina, I remember thinking, did not deserve to be asphyxiated. And I was still glad I'd come to her aid. Now she was staring at me with eyes as big as saucers, murmuring something in her native tongue. She spoke the dialect of Spanish where everyone has a lisp. I saw Snow, whose lovely face, lit from within, bore the light, drying tracks of tears, and the vibrant rose, nervous and biting her nails, beside a Tiffany table lamp effulgent with orange-pink roses. And I was overcome with a curious feeling of satisfaction, as though I'd eaten a full meal and was preparing now for a long winter sleep. With the father lying inert between us and his blue and white seersucker, I felt we were all where we were meant to be, all posed in a tableau whose composition had been perfectly chosen a very long time ago. Whatever came afterward, I recall thinking, this was a warm cave full of soft, harmless things. And that's it. Thank you. been lucky to hear that story read aloud a few times this year and every time I love it and I'm filled at the end of it with that consolation that you get from the happy ending of fairy tales which is so misunderstood. Um, Tolkien, um, a great writer, thought that the happy ending of the fairy tale was too deeply disparaged, that it's not a simple happy ending at all um, and that it's deeply necessary. It always comes after great cost, somebody being torn apart or some terrible crime being almost committed. Um, and your story also reminds me how fairy tales are not insider stories. They are so often about marginalized characters, animals, places, um, being restored somehow to something they somehow strangely deserve. So thanks for reading that. I'm gonna read a short story now from the collection that came out this year called Horse, Flower, Bird. It's eight fairy tales and I should mention that the book itself was just beautifully produced by my publisher, Coffee House Press, with little illustrations by the novelist and painter, Ricky Ducournay. Um, there are just these otherworldly pictures, and I'm so happy to have them in there because the book comprises sort of an homage to children's books and picture books as much as to fairy tales, although it's not a book for children. It's so much about that possibility space that reading provides um, in childhood and the sometimes fraught transition when you realize that the world is, is not necessarily a storybook world at all. Um, but this story is called A Cageling Tale. And as I tell my mother every time I read it, it's not autobiographical. A Cageling Tale. Once upon a time, a girl of 17, or maybe 18, got a parakeet and kept it in her room. The girl's mother, with whom the girl lived alone, didn't like this at all. The mother thought birds, whether herons or doves, peacocks or wrens, defined filth. Bird hating was a strong female tradition in this family with a not very interesting history. For example, one old aunt had lost her mind and imagined birds everywhere. She'd yell, birds, birds, and wave her arms around whenever anything, a branch, someone's hand, even the wind, got too near her body. And the girl's grandmother had a vengeance for birds. She had very bad vision and once, mistakenly, got a chair upholstered in a fabric that depicted garish birds. Strangely, the girl's mother, whose mother this was, seemed to take some kind of wicked glee in the error and never revealed it to her. The girl was against phobias, both in general and in the bird particular. That's why she got a parakeet and caged it. However, she pitied the sky blue bird for being confined. It looked happy enough in its cage staring with unblinking eyes, licking its wings, but could it really be happy in there? Soon she took to letting the parakeet out of its cage when the mother was out of the house. The bird knew not to soil the room and only to soil the square of sandpaper that perfectly lined its cage. So the girl's mother never knew the bird often flew willy-nilly. Furnished in pink, yellow, and green, the bedroom complemented the bird's powdery blue. 
Lying in bed, watching the pale bird toss itself through the pastel scene, the girl felt in the best way, pastoral, nearly. The girl grew to love the parakeet so much, it was painful. Sometimes, she imagined roasting its sweet body, putting the poor thing onto a stick over a fire. It was so small and delicate, it was hard not to think this. Previously, the girl hardly liked anything at all that could breathe, let alone talk. But thankfully, unlike human animals, the parakeet could only say what she let it. So far, it could speak her name, Edith, its name, Pretty Eyes, and one saying, you're sexy. Pretty Eyes was close to saying hot lady and nice rack. This was to scandalize the mother, who had phobias about words like sexy, lady, and rack. The bird was a loyal friend. Sometimes, though, Edith became quite tired of her. Though the gender of the bird was unknown, Edith thought of it as her. Edith was very moody, and many of her moods were not good. And when in a bad mood, Edith could stand nothing to see her. This presented a bit of a problem with pretty eyes, whose smooth, bald head, despite those feathers, it was smooth as a tiny, little ball, was all eyes. You're sexy, she said, making eye contact. When Edith was sad, this comment crushed her. But Edith quickly discovered a solution to the trouble of juggling moods and the bird. All she had to do was cover the bird cage with a dark plastic shroud, shaped perfectly to the cage, and make the bird think it was night. Once covered, it shut up and slept. So as the moods came often, Edith often covered the bird. She felt no guilt about it at all, however. Just as with her resistance to phobias, Edith had something against guilt, another devious maternal vice. Yet Edith felt she owed Pretty Eyes something for having to so passively bend to her will. So she began to allow Pretty Eyes free range of her room at all times, even when the mother was home. This meant the lithe blue creature got to flap through the room at very late hours when it was dark outside and the lights were on. Then the windows reflected the room back into the room so the parakeet would not see the window pane that separated the room from the world. The pink flowered walls and yellow rug and green curtains seemed to spread beyond where they did into a whole other room identical to this one. There was thick glass and then dark woods full of crows and mice and men who chased you home. But Pretty Eyes was just a bird with a small parakeet brain. She didn't know. So after not very much time had passed since Edith began letting her out of the cage when the outdoors had blackened, Pretty Eyes flew into the window and died. With horror, Edith quietly placed her back into the cage. The next morning, she began to fake weep when her mother entered the room. Wake up, piglet, another day in which to excel. To Edith's dismay, she soon found herself an actual morning, pointing wordlessly sobbing at the dead bird. Her mother just stared and then said with a frown as if she'd rehearsed, you may eat like a bird because you like the look, but you never fed this bird what birds ought to eat. No wonder it's dead. You'll probably be dead soon too. I don't miss the bird and I refuse to miss you. Edith either misinterpreted this last phrase or not and assumed her mother meant she wished Edith had never been born. It took little hesitation for Edith to leave. She packed a bag, buried the bird, got in a bus, and moved on. Flew the coop, as it were. So it was, in diffident anonymity, that Edith, that Edith began to work as a topless dancer in a city far away, where, suspended from a red room's ceiling in a cage, she swung on a bench and tilted so that her long hair spilled down her back and flew out of the cage in wisps. All the girls had roles they played, and Edith's was advertised as the cageling. In her role, she didn't do much except stand around in the cage or swing or sometimes crouch in a bird-like manner at the edge of the cage and kind of lean against the metal rods of the cage, looking sad. Between acts, she'd sip a beverage at the bar. In her pale blue bathrobe with its wide gauzy sleeves and with her small eyes, she looked rather like her poor dead bird. This job suited Edith well. It was easy, the men were nice, and she didn't have to talk to anyone while she performed. I can be any kind of bird I want in the cage, right? She'd ask the manager upon being hired. I don't have to be a talking bird. To which she agreed. My girls don't talk, he said, in exactly the tone one expects such a man to use. So it didn't matter if she was in one of her moods at this job. Bitterness, sadness, unpleasantness, horror. They were all the same to a girl in a cage, standing around with the bird's blank stare in her eyes, feeling nothing but air in her bones. Eventually, of course, Edith got too old for the job. 
The place preferred its girls young in addition to quiet, and when she turned 30, they let her go. But like other girls who worked there, Edith had made the acquaintance of some men at the club, and together they pulled some dough and kept her up rather well. This was common. Some girls wanted swimming pools, some wanted diamonds and leather and pearls. Not Edith. She wanted a modest allowance, enough for food, electricity, the movies. Grateful, Edith was kind to her men. Not prone to speaking, how could she fail to please them? Eventually, she was able to afford a two-bedroom apartment. One bedroom was for sleeping and the friendships that paid. The other she kept close to the men. Inside the room, she began to build a cage for herself, the cage of her dreams. It was made of metal she found and lugged home, scraps of automobiles, machinery, saws. She'd stand in the room for hours at a time, welding that cage into perfect submission with tools she'd received as gifts from her men. She asked for blowtorches, vices, and saws. Curiously, her gentle friends never asked why she'd want them. Finally, after many months of work, Edith has finished. The cage has round steel edges that nearly touch the sides of the room in which it's contained. And when you open the door and look in, you can see through the bars and windows to outside where spreads a thick brick wall. This cage is very helpful to Edith. Though her life is nice enough, what with her income and her lack of phobias and guilt, those moods still come and go, despite her sweet men, despite how well things have worked out when you really look at them. But if she didn't know better, Edith would start talking aloud, staring too much toward the brick wall outside. For now, she simply enters the cage, closes the door, and sits down. Not moving, she feels calm. And when you really think about it, what makes that so wrong? Thanks. Stop. Me. Sound okay? We have time for some audience questions, if there are any. Or I can start things off by asking Lydia. Oh, yes. I think that's a question for you. Yeah? Well, I feel like fairy tales picked me more than I picked them, but we, you know, so many of us fall in love with reading through a story or a book in childhood that somebody introduces us to that has that element of wonder. Of course, in their older manifestations, fairy tales weren't intended for children at all. That's why there are so many vestiges of violence, sex, cannibalism, you know, um, in them. As much as people sort of tried to adapt them into the nursery room, they kept those vestiges of, of strangeness and of a very real world. I felt very drawn to them as a child, um, as I felt drawn to books, but especially fairy tale books. And I was also introduced to the Disney movies. And I feel like some of the resurgence in fairy tales today has to do with a generation of artists, thinkers, writers, scholars growing up in an age of Disney, whether responding to those stories by resistance or by reverence, um, they do enter us. My grandfather had a sort of distant job as a publicist for Disney. He'd place ads for their premieres in Boston newspapers. But as such, he got to show us the films in his basement. And so they were really larger than life for me down there on a projector. This is before DVDs, and before it was common to see a film in your home. And we'd sit down there in the basement, my brother and sisters and I, and sometimes the movies would start to burn at the edges. And this, you know, you'd see the melting at the edge of the screen, and we just always thought it was part of the spectacle. Um, so I just think that these seemed truly to be magical spaces where anything could happen, unlike outside of books. Um, but they also didn't shy away from the sadness and from the fears that we have. And they fulfilled something in me that I just committed to pretty early on without really recognizing it. And then I re-encountered the stories as an adult writer, and I, I just realized how much they meant to me and to everyone and immersed myself in it. But you too, Lydia. You've loved Wonder Stories since you were a child. I have always loved them, yeah. I mean, uh, I had a particularly, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know who published this book, and, and I still have it and read to my daughter from it many nights. 
um, and I don't know who published it, but it was a treasury of fairy tales that was illustrated by all these different artists, and so every tale had a different sort of visual idiom that went along with it. And, um, and it was just, it was, a, it was a great book. It had some of the Anderson tales and some of the Grimm tales and some Perot. And, um, you know, uh, some of them were quite sad and grim, and others were monstrous, and others were just light-hearted and humorous. And I think I liked the breadth of fairy tales, you know, and how they could evoke both the monstrous and the sort of the ethereal and the sublime, you know, um, and sometimes both at once. Uh, so, so for me, yeah, they've just always been quite, quite captivating. Yeah, they're really not stories that rely ultimately on binaries. So I think that they appeal to our senses in that sort of spectral and very horizontal way. There are a great number of political fairies. I mean, the history itself is hundreds of years old, and it's as diverse as any artistic tradition. But fairy tales have been employed politically in all kinds of ways, we could say for good or for evil. Um, they've been, you know, they're just such incredibly adaptive stories. They're incredible, really receptacles and possibility spaces themselves. So people have taken fairy tales and retold them to suit their own purposes again and again. Um, and even in some of their earliest manifestations, they're deeply political, um, although you can't pin it down to just one function again. But there are a lot of great political fairy tales. Yes. Yeah, Kate and I were just talking the other day about sort of the, you know, the, the term fairy tale and also the term folk tale and people's relationships to those actual terms. I mean, I've certainly encountered people who tell me they don't like fairy tales or they're not particularly interested in fairy tales, but then it turns out that they actually are, and they might call them by a different name. And, and often it's men who've said this, um, and I think Kate's experienced that too, that there's, a, um, there's sometimes a reluctance to be associated in public with fairy tales. Uh, and I don't suggest that's just because of some association with like homophobia or anything like that. I think it's much... I think it's much uh, more subtle and complex and stuff. The, the disinclination of, um, of some writers and some readers to be you know, associated with the term fairy tale, even if they actually do love what's, what that term really does refer to, which are these ancient and um, sort of communally um, sent down stories, right? Sort of stories that have had hundreds of different, iter different iterations oftentimes or passed down. I think that people do come to the term laden with so many assumptions and cliches, in part because of the fairy tales association with the nursery room and with women in particular, but also because they don't have an original. There's no original version of Cinderella. There's no original version of Red Riding Hood. You can only trace and retrace the retellings. And in a culture that so worships the individual artist as a hero and the product of art, that can be alarming. Um, but I have found that a lot of people are surprised to find that they like fairy tales. They think, I'm, I'm really am not a big fan of fairy tales. And then I'll say, well, have you read this one? And I'll show them Donkey Skin, widely referred to as the other Cinderella. It's not a movie that um, was made into a children's animated musical adventure, um, but it's a story where the figure of the girl, who would be Cinderella in the story that most of us think that we know, um, is, well, her, her mother dies, and before she dies, she tells the father, you must not remarry, you must never remarry anybody who is less beautiful or less wise or less kind than I. And she dies, and he mourns for, oh, in some versions of the story, three days, in some versions, three weeks. And his eyes light upon his daughter. And he, this light bulb goes on and above his head, basically. And he thinks, oh, well, there is a, a girl I know as beautiful, wise, and kind as, as my you know, deceased wife. And he asks his daughter for her hand in marriage. Um, anyway, she escapes in a donkey skin, a, a real donkey skin, and 
goes to a neighboring kingdom and works in the basement, you know, as a scullery maid. Eventually, of course, she's discovered as the princess she is, and she's restored to her golden place. And she goes back home with her newly betrothed husband to live with her dear, beloved father again. <laughs> Um, it's a really strange story. It's, you know, it's, imagine handing that in to an MFA workshop if you're in one. People would say, well, what's our motivation for going back home? Um, you know, there's really no depth to the characters. But it's delightful, and you read it, and you sort of accept, you accept this. But likewise, the story is very quick to point out how desperately wrong the father's advances are. Um, but, you know, she doesn't become neurotic on them. But there's something really transformative and possible about that. Um, it doesn't limit the reader's relationship to the story or define it um, by terms that may have been invented to serve ulterior motives, I think, um, in most of the stories. But I think if somebody in here thinks they don't like fairy tales, just go to the library and pick up Italo Calvino's Italian folk tales, amazing renditions, or Hans Christian Andersen. Make sure you, you know, find a translation that speaks to you. Um, you. You can find the Chinese ghost fairy tales are especially fascinating. I'm delving into those a lot right now. And just look back at some of them, and you might be surprised. They're as diverse as anything. So the Calvino collection is really excellent, I think. And, it's and great. And very mystifying, often. You know, it's just quite mysterious. Yeah, the Calvino is a great place to start, and he was interviewed often about his love of fairy tales, and he always said, well, you know, most people like fairy tales, think they like fairy tales for their magic, but I like them for their firm form. He's really interested in their structure and in their, you know, technical components. Um, and his introduction to that book is great, too. He talks about how when you translate a fairy tale, you are rewriting it, and how many alterations he made just to suit his imagination. I'm frequently asked, well, what, what is a fairy tale? The scholar Jack Sipes, who um, is Professor Emeritus at the University of Minnesota, has a great saying about that where he says, there's no such thing as a fairy tale. There are fairy tales. Um, and Nabokov also famously was quoted as saying, all great novels are great fairy tales. Sort of a you know, self-reflecting response. But I, I think a fairy tale is a story. And by story, I mean anything. It could be a painting, a poem, a comic, a film with a fairy tale feel. It has the affect of fairy tales. But there are elements you can identify that tell you you're in a fairy tale. You usually know when you're in one, and it's almost any time you open a book too, once upon a time, or there's that, you know, there's a book played, or there's a the end. Um, they have certain tropes, technically, that authors over hundreds of years amplify or minimize to suit their own mind. Um, there are things like everyday magic, so the magic and the real aren't distinct. So an example would be in Red Riding Hood, if a wolf talks to the girl on the path, she's not afraid that there's a talking wolf. She's only afraid later when the wolf is dressed as the grandmother at the moment he says he'll eat her. Um, so the, sort of the magic is logical, it's everyday, um, and there's a sort of also just so quality to fairy tales where things happen right when they need to, and sometimes they happen just because. It's not the same thing as, oh, a dream world or anything goes. They have a certain progression where things happen in a just so fashion. And they have this depthlessness, which doesn't mean they come only in minimalist forms. And then they also have a lot of use of abstraction. These are sort of the major techniques, and any writer will amplify or minimize them to suit his or her mind. Um, but there's a great book by Max Luthi, L-U-T-H-I, um, called The European Folktale, where he talks about the specifically European folktale and its techniques. But I find that those techniques are really applicable to all kinds of contemporary fiction, from mainstream to experimental as well. You can find those vestiges of fairy tale. They have historically been, and we're talking about recent history with the term magical realism, I think that that's phobic. 
I think it's a phobia. I'm against phobias, as you know. <laughs> um, I think of magical realism, and I'm writing an article about this. It's a kind of fairy tale, actually, a subtype of fairy tale. Sometimes people call these stories wonder tales, the scholar Marina Warner does. Um, but magical realism is different because it makes a lot of ado about magic. Um, so it takes that component of fairy tale and expands it greatly. It's, I love magical realism. Um, they, studies show that some readers of the male variety are more comfortable saying they like folk tales than fairy tales. Um, you speculated it was actually the word fairy or mm -hmm. the lance. You, yeah, it's just a, it's an idle speculation. Just no not to do with the homophobia, but with just the word fairy, the figure right. of the fairy, perhaps. And right, fairy. the sort of the qualities of fairiness. What is you know, yeah, even the, just the fanciful, you know, versus the concrete. But I think some of it, I think the reason magical realism may have more acceptance as capital L literature is because it was sort of um, formulated as a genre and a kind of story to give it serious credence. So to name the movement, fairy tales have, have been named for a very long time, so they have a lot of prejudice laden upon them. I've had a lot of writers, when I invite them to particular anthologies, say, well, it won't be considered a serious writer if I write a fairy tale for you, if I talk about loving fairy tales, um, women and men. Women saying, well, I'm already considered a woman writer, and I don't want to write about fairy tales. And men saying, well, people won't take me as seriously. And, and they just say this in emails. So you know, there, there's a record. Um, when, I won't publicize their names, though. But one writer I really, really like said to me once, well, if you, were, if you called, if you asked me to write you a really weird story with lots of old stuff in it, I'd probably do it, but I can't do it if it's called a fairy tale. So he just said point blank. It was the term. He just didn't know why it was uncomfortable for him. But I'm working, and I've been working for many years to try to reverse that for people and to turn them back to these old stories. I think I'm getting the, so I think we're out of time, but we will be answering questions quickly as we sign books if you want to come up and ask that I could talk, as you can tell, for hours and days, thousand and one nights about fairy tales. So I'll stop here. But thanks, Lydia. Thanks, thanks guys for coming. Thank you.